times like this, I wish I had a more dynamic personality just because it's very clear to me that we are all very low energy today. I mean, just, it's like, like probably for many reasons, uh, but anyway, just stating the obvious, I will try to be as lively as possible. I might throw something at you if I feel like you're falling asleep or something. Um, but we'll try to I don't know, keep this going here in spite of the kind of dreary weather and everything and a lot of guys tired from yesterday I know but uh, anyway I do want to pray before I get started with teaching and then we'll get into Matthew and we'll I'll teach what I have for today let's go ahead and pray though <coughs> oh, Father very thankful thankful in Christ for all that you've given us in Christ. We have claim to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and a claim that thankfully does not rest in us, but in Christ himself. And we thank you that he has already done everything and more than we could even think for us in being our savior. And we come entirely in that confidence and that hope and in that joy. And we thank you that there is no one who can take that joy away from us. Now as we meet as your people, uh, it's time to study your word. And I ask your help just after what really was, I guess, months of preparation for this particular message, in a sense. Uh, I ask your help for it, that it would help your people to see what we have in Christ uh, both just in terms of the challenges that lay in store for us, but also what you have done and how you've provided for us a real source of faith and hope in Christ in these things. So please, Father, strengthen us through this word, strengthen me, and we ask your help just as we try to really take these things and make them part of us and to live them out. We ask that that would be the case in the end of these things. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. So this is, I guess I need to open my Bible as well. This is still very much Matthew section five as I have outlined Matthew, which I have titled this portion of Matthew, the suffering king explains his kingdom, because that is I think how Jesus portrays himself and what Jesus does throughout these several chapters of Matthew that I have roped off as one section. And that starts back in 1621, which is the verse I gave you for our starting point today. It really goes until Jesus enters Jerusalem, so through chapter 20. That's section 5 of Matthew, as I've called it. And so far, we've done about a full chapter's worth, gone from about halfway uh, through chapter 16, through to the halfway mark of chapter 17, really, I believe. So we've covered quite a lot of ground so far. And today's message is gonna be a summary treatment of that portion of Matthew's fifth section. So definitely a review message. Uh, again, not, the, uh, not quite as exciting as breaking new ground, but I still think quite necessary in terms of making sure we're getting everything that Matthew is doing as he talks about the ministry of Christ, especially in this phase where we've been. I don't know if you've noticed as we've gone through this, but this portion of Matthew is all connected as a single chain of events. It is all one kind of long rambling account as we go from 1621 through 1723. So it begins with Jesus making his first announcement about his imminent suffering, death, and resurrection. That's how he begins this section. After Peter rebukes Jesus for that announcement, Jesus tells his disciples that they all must be willing to face the same end. So he rather turns it all around on them. Not only is it uh, rather hard for Peter to take, it's going to be hard for all of them to take because they're all going to be walking the same kind of road. Then Jesus concludes that kind of sobering challenge with a promise that some of his disciples will see him coming in his kingdom before they taste death. So he moves from uh, one thing into this promise here, moves from his... Uh, his promise of their hardships to a promise of some sort of glory. And the fulfillment of that promise comes six days later 
again, very much connecting to all of that has come before, in the transfiguration of Jesus on a mountain, where they see him, where three of his disciples see him revealed in his heavenly glory. And then as Jesus and those three disciples come down from the mountain, they discuss John the Baptist, his role as Elijah, his own death, and how Jesus must suffer the same end as John did. But all of that plays on what just happened in the transfiguration. And then when they return to the foot of the mountain where they left the other disciples, Jesus is asked to heal a demonized boy, which leads him to teach about faith. So you go right from one story into another, just as we've been doing for the past several accounts. And then finally, as the disciples gather together again, Jesus makes his second announcement about his imminent suffering, death, and resurrection. So he again tells them much what he told them before about what is lying in store for him in the near future. And so this whole portion is connected as one chain of events. It just goes from one thing into another, boom, 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 throughout this portion. The chain even ends where it started, where Jesus announces his upcoming suffering, death, and resurrection. It's where he starts and it's where he ends. It's very much a united, single account. Now that observation is probably enough to justify a summarizing message. Now that we've come to the end of all that, it's probably, that's probably good enough reason to look back and say, okay, where have we been? What have we seen? But there's actually another reason to give a summary before moving forward. And that is the fact that this portion of Matthew also presents a common theme. Not only is it just one story kind of rambling on for a good long while, it actually does have a united purpose, I think, as Matthew tells it. See, in this portion of Matthew, we see that the kingdom of God requires faith and hope in the face of suffering and death. And if that sounds like a carefully crafted summary statement, that's because it is a carefully crafted summary statement of all that we've seen since the beginning of this fifth section of Matthew. So going from 1621 through to 1723 where we stopped, that's how I would summarize that portion of Matthew. I've titled the whole fifth section, of course, as the suffering king explains his kingdom. So what does Jesus want to explain about his kingdom to his disciples? Well, the first thing in this first portion of this section is what I just said, that the kingdom of God requires faith and hope in the face of suffering and death. That is the first thing Jesus wants to explain to his disciples as he goes through these things and really prepares them for his own death and his resurrection. That's how he wants to explain it to them starting off. So my summary message today will show this theme as Jesus explains it throughout this portion of Matthew. And my outline is based on the messages I have already given throughout this portion. I have taught uh, maybe seven or eight messages. I did a count here, but now I'm not sure if it's accurate looking at my notes. Uh, but anyway, seven or eight or so messages on all of this. Normally I would give you them all in outline format, but with that long of an outline, I think it's not very helpful to do that. What I will do is basically I will revisit every message I have done, every passage we have studied as we've gone through this portion of Matthew. And for each point, I will do two things. First, I will summarize what we learned just to get everything back into your mind and presented before you afresh, at least in summary form. And then secondly, I will connect it back to this common theme that the kingdom of God requires faith and hope in the face of suffering and death. So I will stitch it all together for you, showing you how all of this contributes to a common theme. So that is what I have in mind for this message. And that's where I'm going to start at the very first passage that we studied. And the way I see it, this first passage functions as our first view of this common theme. So, chapter 16, verse 21, where I told you we'd start, I'm going to read through verse 25. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests, chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So that is passage number one and message number one in what I have been doing over the past several months. And in that passage we saw <clears throat> that the kingdom of heaven requires what I called suffering for life. I use that exact phrase and I said that when I use that phrase suffering for life I mean two things. I meant it to have a double meaning and that is first of all duration and secondly motivation. It is suffering for life because it shows you yes this is how the Christian life is throughout its extent. There is a lot of hardship to be taken uh, in the Christian life and so as a matter of duration it is suffering for life but it is also motivation, goal. Why do we bother with this? You know, why do we undertake this hard life of a disciple? Well, the motivation for that is to gain life. We are suffering for the purpose of gaining life. And to make all of that as uh, full as I could from that passage, I gave you three points on that. First of all, to start with Jesus himself, that Jesus will soon win the victory of resurrection through the suffering of death. It is victory through suffering of some sort. And on the one hand, you see that Jesus is about to suffer greatly. He's about to suffer actually by the unanimous consent of a whole city, even the city of God, that God's own people are going to agree with one another, this guy needs to die. So uh, certainly a great uh, blow to him. But Jesus was not daunted by this at all. Rather, he embraced it and went forward anyway because he knew that through his suffering and death, he would win the victory of resurrection. He knew that was not the end. He knew all of that was a means to an end, and it was the victory of his own resurrection and his return to the right hand of God. Furthermore, we saw that Jesus embraced that suffering for life, as it very much was for him, in spite of opposition from earth and hell. So even though he was getting hit by everything possible, he still moved forward with that plan, according to the same motivation that he had in winning through those things and gaining victory. We saw that Jesus had to endure mankind's disbelief, the example of which was Peter's rebuke of him. So even his most ardent follower at this point uh, certainly does not understand why he is doing what he is doing. And so mankind's own faithlessness very much posing a stumbling block to Jesus to the point where he has to rebuke Peter and even call him Satan. Speaking of Satan, we have the other side of it as well, not just opposition from earth, but also opposition from hell because you have Satan's craftiness coming in here. And I mentioned that one of the ways you can get someone to do something if you know they won't listen to you is to get one of your maybe your common friends to go on your behalf and try to get this person to see it from your perspective, kind of this roundabout way. It's very much what Satan does here. Satan sort of uses Peter, although Peter himself certainly did not know this. Satan uses Peter to tempt Jesus away from what God wants him to do. So you see opposition both from earth and from hell. And that's just recently. That's just in this one rebuke from Peter at this time. And Jesus has endured this sort of thing for his whole life. He will endure it even more as he continues on the way to Jerusalem. And that tension and that temptation is just going to keep building from him as both earth and hell come against him to try to stop him. And yet even in spite of all of that, he is still embracing this lifetime and this death of a very much a suffering kind of life and a suffering kind of death. But I said that he was doing that, of course, for the victory of resurrection. And then Jesus turns around and applies all of that to his disciples and requires his disciples to share his resurrection by sharing his death. And this, of course, is where he tells them, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, which is very much the language of death, but also the language of resurrection, of finding their life again and keeping it forever. The original disciples were required to follow Jesus on the road to crucifixion, which for them was no figure of speech. For several of them, it was quite literal. For most of them, it was at least very much a literal death awaiting them at the end of their life, a death by martyrdom. And that is very much how it was for them. So not metaphorical by any means. But in spite of all that, and through all of that, the disciples would share in Christ's resurrection. They had a promise that if they laid down their lives for Christ's sake, they would find it again. So both in the life of Christ 
and his disciples, we see that the kingdom of heaven requires this mentality of suffering for life, both in terms of its duration, but also in terms of its motivation of why you're going through this at all. So when we look at this whole passage here, we look at the passage connected to the whole that I'm connecting it to, this portion of Matthew, we see that it functions as this first view of this common theme that the kingdom of God requires faith and hope in the face of suffering and death. This passage is very much a small statement of all of that right here at the beginning. This passage describes what you might call Jesus' first act, first proclamation as king, right? Because Peter has just confessed him to be the Christ. Right before we started, the last thing that happened was Peter gave his confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So he is the king and he is the, the, the king of the kingdom of God. So what is his first act? Well, his first act is to proclaim suffering and death, not only for him, but also for his followers. We find that the entire citizenry of the kingdom of heaven, from the king down to the disciples themselves, is very much subjected to this kind of life. The king will suffer and die first, and after that his disciples will be subject to the same. As it goes with the king, so it goes with the whole kingdom. No one is exempt from this kind of life. It is to be very much the standard. But we also see in this passage the first taste of the hope that is in the kingdom as well. We also see the, uh, the faith and what is meant to strengthen our faith as we go through all this. Christ himself, first of all, will triumph over death in resurrection. You know, oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus is going to beat death by rising from the dead. And we Christians also, if we follow him faithfully even to the death, we will find our lives again and keep our lives forever, just as he did, and we also will triumph over death. And there we have our hope. It is also the object of our faith that Christ has done these things already, and in that faith we move forward just as he did. So in this passage, we see really this first view of this common theme that you will find over the next several verses of Matthew that we've already gone over, that the kingdom of God requires faith and hope in the face of this suffering and death. So this is really the overall statement of everything we're about to see in the upcoming passages. We're just going to get it in more detail or more focus on various aspects of it. And that's where our second passage comes in here, which focuses on self-denial and takes the main theme of this portion and to, in a large way, amplifies it. That's the way I described it. It makes it bigger. It makes it bolder. So let's keep reading. We'll start in verse 24, then read a little further than we did before. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. From this passage, we learn that self-denial as a disciple is the only way to serve your own interests. I sort of turned it around a little bit. Of course, Jesus does that himself here, showing that your denying of yourself in Christ's name is actually the only way to uh, come out on top in your own life and actually get what is best for you. The only way to do that is through self-denial. So Jesus, we see, <laughs> requires his disciples to embrace self-denial. And that the word there is embrace. It's a choice. You actually have to decide to do this because you're not going to wake up someday and be pleasantly surprised to realize you have developed the habit of denying yourself. That's not how it works. You have to actually decide to do this. You have to embrace self-denial as a disciple. Now, to give you a reason to do that, Jesus moves forward and he says, it's the only way to keep your own life eternally. This is, in fact, the great twist of all Christian living, that if you want to actually come out and arrive at something that's maximally best, I mean, your, your best life, not now, but your best life eventually, eternal life, the only way to get to that point is to deny yourself right now and face the kinds of things that Jesus himself faced and face those things for your whole life. 
On the other hand, refusing that life of self-denial leads to what I called a futile loss of an irredeemable life. And that's where I play on what Jesus says here. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Okay, great. So you, you lived it up. You got everything. You did everything. So what? Then you die and you can't take it with you. It counted for nothing. Just so what? That was totally futile. It was a futile loss. And not only that, but he says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You might entertain the possibility when death comes for you of buying back your life from death. The problem is you've already lost everything because you died. You can't do anything. You can't get it back. There is no trade. There is no way to get back what you had. It's totally irredeemable by that point. It cannot be bought back. Meanwhile, if you had practiced self-denial, properly understood it and practiced it, if you had done that, you would have been repaid well when Christ comes to judge the earth, which is where he goes with his, his reference to the final judgment here at the end of this passage. It's not just a time for doling out to the wicked what they deserve. It's a time for rewarding those who actually did follow Christ. And those who denied themselves and followed Christ as a disciple will find themselves blessed in that day and repaid for all they did, making self-denial the only way to serve your own interests in the kingdom of heaven. Now, as I said, that passage takes the main idea of this portion of Matthew, I think, and amplifies it, makes it a bit bigger and a bit bolder in the way Jesus talks about it. First of all, the suffering and the death become grittier when viewed as a part of self-denial. That is this discipline of making yourself undergo these things as an act of will. You see, the wickedness of the earth affords a great many occasions for people to be subjected to suffering and death against their will. Bad stuff happens all the time. You're just going along your business, trying to do things that you think will, ple will please you and be good for you, and then all of a sudden tragedy comes in or calamity. And you just have to face it because you don't have a choice. That kind of thing happens very, very often. But life in the kingdom of God is not about being forced to undergo suffering and death against your will. Rather, discipleship is about willingly choosing a life that you know will take you to dark places. You worship and serve a man who was nailed to a cross by an angry mob. What do you expect from the rest of your life? That's the man you follow. I mean, you have yourself, in becoming a Christian, you have said you are willing to undergo a life in which you deliberately deny yourself and endure whatever God has in store for you. You see, those who are subjected to suffering have just one hardship to face. They just have to deal with whatever was dealt to them. But with us, we kind of have it in double. First, we have this sort of choice to make where we decide to do this, and we decide to keep doing it no matter how bad it gets. And then we have to endure the actual problem itself. So we kind of have the inner psychological problem and the rough choice we have to make of actually making ourselves decide we are going to live this life no matter what, and then actually living it out. So the suffering and death really become a lot grittier when you view it in the context of self-denial. Not that we're being forced to live this kind of life, but that we have chosen this kind of life. It really brings it closer to home when you view it that way. But the other side of this also gets amplified. The other side, the faith and the hope, become loftier. They become grander. You see, humans, just speaking of humanity in general, whether Christian or not, humans have, for the most part, mastered this art of enduring grief for gain. We do it to some degree every time we go into work when we don't like our job, whenever we do one thing in order to gain a greater result later on, and we just sort of take the hit now and because we know it's going to pay off later. We do that. I mean, humanity does that. We've done this for thousands of years now. No surprise to us when we have to do that. But the world has only mastered this art because the rewards for the troubles are not very far away. They expect things to pay off relatively soon, especially within this lifetime. They expect that as they keep living their life, they're going to see the payoff for all the pain they've endured and all the investments they have made. They view them as investments that are going to pay off at some point within a couple of years, hopefully. I mean, they view it that way. They have a very much a short-term way of viewing this. In the kingdom of God, however, we have to set our sights much higher. We have to go much further out for our payoff, so to speak, because all of our rewards are more distant. 
We speak of the age to come and how things are going to be when Christ returns. Eternity future, we sometimes call it. We're looking way out there, you know, way out there, which you might look at that and say, oh man, we got to wait all this time for our good things, you know, to receive these things that we have very much laid up for ourselves as we've stored up treasures in heaven. But in another way, it shows you the quality of our faith and our hope. We are either, I'll give you the choice here. I'm pretty sure you know which one it is. We are either delusional to the extreme or we have grasped something very lofty far over the heads of most. We have actually seen something. We have actually caught a vision of something so great and so grand that it compels us to live a certain way even though it is so far out there. And we have to count it in terms not of years, but of ages in order to get to it. And yet that has laid such a hold on us that our faith in it is strong enough and our hope in it is strong enough to propel us forward no matter what. It really makes our faith and our hope all the loftier when you view it in that context of self-denial, of just plowing through the Christian life, however hard it gets, whatever God requires us to face, it very much becomes this profounder thing. So you see the amplification of these ideas here. Yeah, the suffering and the death become grittier, but also the faith and the hope, they become even grander and loftier when you view them in the context of this self-control that Jesus requires of us. So <clears throat> the third passage that we deal with, moving on to my third point here, the one about the transfiguration, where Jesus goes up onto the mountain and is transformed to appear like he very much would in his heavenly glory. This passage, this transfiguration of Jesus, finally shows us the glory that we will have in the future and that it outweighs the suffering and death that Jesus has mentioned so far. This, I argue, was the point of this, and I want to come back to it. Just to read the passage, started in chapter 16, verse 28. We're going to read through the transfiguration account. It says, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, that would be some of his disciples, right? Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light, looking very much like the king of the kingdom of heaven, you would say. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. Lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Okay, so I have to turn the page here. Okay, so I called my first message on this passage the preview of kingdom glory. This first look at the glory that comes with the kingdom of God when it is fully revealed. The first thing I did in that message was show how the promise made in verse 28 is fulfilled in the transfiguration. When he tells his disciples that some of them will not taste death until they see him coming in his kingdom, the fulfillment of that is the transfiguration which follows right after. I gave five reasons for that, spanning the Gospels, the book of Daniel, and really the rest of the New Testament as well. If you want me afterward to repeat those reasons, I can, but for right now I'm just going to state the fact that I did talk about that, and then move on to what really is the main point, and that is that the transfiguration is a preview of Jesus' Jesus's glory as king. It is a first glance at what it will be like when his kingdom is fully consummated. When the disciples saw on that mountain, when the disciples saw that, it is a smaller, shorter version of what Jesus gained after he ascended back to God. So Jesus right now at the right hand of glory, ruling as king right now, 
has glory like that. Furthermore, that vision on the mountain is also a preview of what Christ will bring back to the earth when he returns to rule as the undisputed king on the earth. So it's also a preview of what will be on the earth again, except this time instead of just being limited to that mountain, it's going to be worldwide. It's going to be all over. And in the end, I brought that message around to what this vision would have meant to the disciples who were viewing it there in that moment, especially, you know, Peter, James, and John being there on the mountain, but also the other disciples once they finally heard about it, after uh, Peter, James, and John were able to share what happened, what it would have meant to them. They have been told that they must endure suffering and death. They have just been told that they have to take up their cross, and probably literally taking up their cross, and following Jesus as he goes to his death. They need something to strengthen their faith and their hope. Right here at the beginning of this life that Jesus has in store for them, they need something now that can give them a bit of a shot of courage to make this work. They need something to strengthen their faith and hope right now, and what they get is probably the best thing imaginable, a preview of who Jesus really is, what his glory will be like, and what it will be like to be with him for all eternity. They get that as their uh, dose of courage here at the beginning of the long, hard life Jesus has in store for them. And so this preview, connecting this to our main theme here for this portion of Matthew, this preview finally shows that the glory of our future will outweigh suffering and death. That what we get over here is much greater than what we have to endure. If you personally have found this portion of Matthew a little bit exhausting, don't worry because I have too. I mean, going through all of this, Jesus talking about his death, talking about what his disciples have to endure, and knowing that we are them, we are one of them, and we therefore, you know, we have to get ready to endure possibly whatever life as a disciple has in store for us. And it's just like, ah, is this, is this all we get? Is this what it means to follow Christ? Do we get anything better? you know, down the road? Does it ever take a swing for the better? Yes, it does. It does very much. When Christ returns and when all things are summed up the way they are supposed to be, we will all be saying with Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here. None of us will be saying, well, that was a long, hard road. Wish I didn't have to go through all of that. We're going to forget about all of that. And we're going to say with Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here. The end result is good. That's our assessment. That is what our assessment is going to be by the time this is over. Whatever we face as we follow Christ on the road of the cross, on the road of the cross, we will be repaid infinitely when we see him in glory. That is ultimately what we get after our life of discipleship. And that is what the transfiguration shows us ultimately. It shows us that the glory of our faith and our hope will outweigh the suffering and death we face as disciples. <clears throat> which brings me to the next part of things, which actually was another message on the transfiguration. I did two messages on this passage because I had another idea I wanted to uh, elaborate upon when I was teaching. So in this case, um, the second message I had on this, if you recall, what I did was I talked about mainly how the transfiguration of Jesus shows that he fulfills and surpasses the entire Old Covenant. It was very much more like a theology of Scripture and uniting the Bible together and showing matters of fulfillment and differences between the Old Covenant and the New. And you might think to yourself, how is that going to play in to this common theme I have built around needing faith and hope to face suffering and death as part of the Kingdom of God? Well, I do think it does play in and I'll show you how. But first of all, let's review that message just briefly. First, I showed you that Jesus' life and death were in accordance with and in fulfillment of the Old Covenant. So what you see going on back in the Old Covenant, Jesus very much continues that and does in many ways fulfill it. We saw that by studying the features of the lives of Moses and Elijah, who appear with Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, very much as representatives of the Old Covenant, everything God had done before Christ came, they show up as representatives of all of that. And their lives, we saw, their lives were in some sense very similar to what Christ had later on when he finally came. 
we see Jesus' life and death very much in accordance with and in fulfillment of the Old Covenant. However, we also saw that Jesus is greater than any man of God from the Old Covenant, greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, and in some ways those two men we argued were the greatest of the great from back then. But Jesus was greater even than them. We saw that ultimately Moses and Elijah were ultimately serving Christ, and the lesser serves the greater, right? Moses and Elijah were just stepping stones on the way to something better, that better thing being the ministry of Christ and the new covenant. And ultimately, all of that was meant to give way to something far grander in Christ. And in that way, you see Jesus, he's even above men like Moses and Elijah. And since Jesus is greater than any old covenant man of God, we saw that the disciples should listen to Jesus more than any man of God from the old covenant. That is a very real sense in which the old covenant was very much a temporary thing. This is, of course, the express statement of other scriptures. But we see it here in a picture form where Moses and Elijah shows up, but Jesus is greater than them, and God comes in that cloud and says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And when the disciples kind of come out of their faint that they have there, they see no one except Jesus himself alone. Moses and Elijah are gone, just like the old covenant, and now here's Jesus, listen to him. So we saw all of that. And it all seems like it might be a little bit off topic from what I'm teaching today, and my idea of this common theme throughout this portion of Matthew. But it's not so, off as, so far off as you might think. The disciples have learned that being a disciple means following Jesus into a dangerous life and likely an early death. And for most of them, that's exactly what it was. For 10 of the 12 disciples, they very much face a martyr's death. That's what it takes. Now the question is, do the disciples have any godly men they can use as examples to embolden their faith and give them hope as they undertake their dangerous life. Can they look to anyone? Or is it just Jesus? You know, can they just look to Jesus? Is there anyone else they can look to for inspiration, for courage, as an example? Well, right there in front of them, they see two of them, Moses and Elijah. Two men who definitely endured much hardship in their own way, just as Christ and his disciples would. Both men endured that hardship ultimately in service to Christ. Even though they didn't really realize that to a fullest degree by any means, they were very much part of something much greater than themselves, and they served that purpose just as the disciples must. And what did Moses and Elijah gain for their sacrifices? They are there with Jesus in glory. In this snapshot of eternal glory, you see Moses and Elijah right there with Christ. The memory of Moses and Elijah standing in the light of Christ after many years of trial would surely serve to strengthen the faith and hope of the disciples for many years, especially Peter, James, and John who were there. Just that vision there of seeing these men who endured so much in that state of glory with Christ would embolden them tremendously. It's like what something uh, Jesus says earlier in Matthew. Just jump back there real quick. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's pretty much the life they have in store for them, following Jesus. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Men like Moses and Elijah, they've been there, they've done that. Are those men blessed? Yes. Okay, so if that's your life, you're heading for the same blessing. And they saw that in vision form at the transfiguration. So even these matters regarding Moses and Elijah and the Old Covenant, they do contribute somewhat to this theme that I have regarding the faith and the hope we need to endure the suffering and even the death that is very much a feature of the kingdom of heaven. And that was the second and last message that I did on the transfiguration. So the next passage takes us a bit more in the direction of suffering and death going on one side of the uh, equation here, namely the inevitability of those things in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a persecuted kingdom. It has been that way and will be that way. And we see that <clears throat> in this passage here about John the Baptist. Going back to our passage, Matthew 17, verse 9. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, 
tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, Who then do the scribes say, uh, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? They just saw Elijah on the mountain, remember? <clears throat> and he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist, who by that point has already been killed by Herod Antipas for his stand for righteousness. Now my message on that passage was called the death of the deathless prophet. And I definitely had double meanings going on there because it's about Elijah, but also about John the Baptist. Elijah being the deathless prophet and John the Baptist being the prophet who dies. I taught that John the Baptist fulfills the prophecy made about Elijah, but also reinforces the notion of sharing Christ's death. So it was very much a message about, you know, piecing your Bible together, seeing how things said back then were fulfilled in the days of Christ, but also coming around to this idea of, again, death as a feature of the kingdom of heaven under Christ. I started that message with the prophecy from Malachi about the return of Elijah before the day of the Lord. Elijah was supposed to return and, in a sense, bring repentance, restore the hearts of parents toward their children, and vice versa. And Jesus, we found out, identifies John the Baptist as the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. So it was not the literal Elijah returning in his whirlwind and fiery chariot down to the earth. It was, in fact, the ministry of John the Baptist who ministered in the spirit and power of Elijah, as uh, Luke's account puts it, whenever he talks about this. Now, in this passage in front of us, Jesus attempts to settle the confusion of the disciples regarding Elijah. And I said they had two points of confusion. There were two things that just weren't clicking in their mind about this whole Elijah business. One was the timing of Elijah's appearance on the mountain. They were expecting Elijah to come first. Instead, they see Elijah come after Jesus because Jesus is there already, and then Elijah shows up on the mountain afterward. So it's all backwards to them. The second point of confusion was the secrecy commanded by Jesus. You would think that now Elijah's here, we should tell people. I mean, this is big news. Elijah just came. But Jesus tells them, be quiet, which is not what they would expect to hear if Elijah just showed up. So they have these two points of confusion. Jesus answers both points by pointing them to John the Baptist. John the Baptist did show up before Jesus. So in that sense, he very much fulfilled the Elijah prophecy of showing up before the Messiah. And then secondly, the reason for the confusion is, the reason for the secrecy is that Jesus wants people to think of John the Baptist as Elijah. And if the disciples start talking about Elijah showing up on the mountain, the whole focus on John is going to be gone. Everyone's going to be focused on the literal Elijah, which would totally derail the plan. So that's why the secrecy. So in both cases, John the Baptist is the answer to the confusion. And I did, after that, I gave six ways that John the Baptist does indeed fulfill the prophecy about Elijah. Again, if you're interested in all six of those, we can, re we can review them if you want to. But for right now, just restate that I did give that six reasons that John does indeed fulfill that prophecy. And then finally, finally, brought it back around to this idea that I really wanted to talk about, that even Elijah suffers death in the kingdom of God. John the Baptist is supposed to be the new Elijah. As such, you would expect him to live forever, just like Elijah did. Instead, wicked people get their hands on him and kill him. And that being the case, what can we expect, right? I mean, John the Baptist, Jesus said he was the greatest man that had been born up until that time. And that guy was killed by the wicked. So what does everyone else in the kingdom of heaven expect? Expect to have rose petals thrown at you? No, that's not how it works. This is the time in history in the kingdom of God when the righteous suffer at the hands of the wicked. And John the Baptist shows that. And as you might guess, it's in that last point that we really connect with the common theme of this part of Matthew. Even Elijah suffers death in the kingdom of God, and so we see the suffering and the death that is very often inherent in following Christ. In the person of John, the Jews got to relive the days of Elijah. You know, I kind of created this scene 
when I taught on that passage that you know they might have wished they could live back in those days because Elijah was so awesome. Well, here in John the Baptist's day, they get to relive those days, but it has a different ending. They had the fiery wilderness prophet proclaiming repentance in the face of hostility from powerful people, but this time the powerful people won. They got him. Elijah didn't go up into heaven in his fiery chariot like he was supposed to. He had his head laid down on a chopping block and pfft, he was beheaded. <clears throat> That's how it ended. The application, of course, being if the deathless prophet dies in the kingdom, how much more can we expect the death of others? Surely if John the Baptist is going to get it, even though he is the fulfillment of Elijah prophecies, if he's going to get it, surely there are going to be other people dying as part of Jesus' kingdom. And if you still have doubts, Jesus himself reemphasizes that he too is going to suffer. It says, so also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. So even the king, even greater than John the Baptist, greater than Elijah, he's going to get it too, and you're following him. All of this very much reinforces the aspects of suffering and death that are very often in the kingdom of God, which are inevitable. Looking at the history of the kingdom so far, 2,000 years, yes. Looking just at predictions of the future, yes. Still going to keep happening. <clears throat> okay, next passage, right? Moving on from the transfiguration stuff. The next passage brings us to an exorcism, the casting out of a demon. And Jesus teaches that he teaches the disciples about faith and prayer. And this is a lesson which are very much necessary for facing the kinds of things Jesus has described to them as being part of the kingdom of God. We'll read the passage here, Matthew 17, verses 14 through 21. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. <clears throat> And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now I had two messages from this passage. I just want to review both of them briefly. There's no need to do too much detail at this point. My first message on this passage was called the power of unbelief because I thought the power of unbelief was a little more prominent in this passage than the power of belief. But in this passage, Jesus very pointedly confronts his disciples regarding faithlessness and faith. Shows them the power of the one, but also the power of the other. Faithlessness, in fact, is the only power which can beat the kingdom of God. The only thing which can hold back God's purposes in the world is the unbelief of the people of God. That's the only thing that can stand in our way. Meanwhile, faith, on the other hand, even in small amounts, can work great wonders, which is where Jesus gets his famous illustration about you know, telling mountains to move by faith. Therefore, the growth of our faith, I said, was essential for the kingdom of God. The disciples were suffering from a littleness of faith. We don't want to see ourselves in that same situation. Therefore, the growth of our faith is very important. That led to my second message, which I handled separately on this passage, called Faith and Prayer. So now we're bringing prayer into the matter. And my main goal was to answer the question, how can we make our faith grow? What do we actually do to see this happen. And I said ultimately the answer for was the answer for having more faith was to pray for it. It was actually a matter of just asking God to give faith. God himself being the source of faith makes perfect sense to go to him asking for greater faith. Now this passage on the exorcism more completely I think represents the faith 
that is, this port, that is in this portion of Matthew that I've been talking about, the faith and the hope that we need to endure the suffering and death, this passage represents the faith that I'm talking about. Now at that moment in the ministry of Jesus, the disciples were not facing death. They were not facing any kind of physical suffering either. They weren't really having too much of a hard time in that sense. They were, however, making a fool of themselves in front of a whole crowd when they couldn't cast out this demon, which was certainly exasperating because they've been able to do that before. They've been able to cast out these demons, but now they can't. So here you have this exasperating circumstance, you know, wondering what's going on and uh, wondering if this crowd's going to turn even uglier if they cannot deliver on the promises of casting out this demon. Well, through this event, they learn a lesson that will serve them well through any and all exasperating circumstances coming up in their life. Whatever they have to face in the future, this lesson will help them. And that lesson is prayer. I mean, faith and how it makes everything possible and prayer being the, re being the way of getting to that increase of faith. You see them learn lessons here which are applicable to any mountain, to use Jesus' illustration. Whether that's a difficult demon or the facing of some kind of persecution, even perhaps martyrdom, no matter what, faith is what empowers us to face these things. So through these events, Jesus teaches them about the faith that is needed to face suffering and death in the kingdom of God and thereby sets them on a path to victorious deaths of their own, as most of them have to endure, sets them on the pathway to that which they will eventually endure successfully by faith. So this faith here being spoken of is very much necessary to enduring the life of a disciple and facing the things that Jesus has in store for his people. So that is how it ties into the common theme that I see in all this passage. That brings us to the last passage of this portion of Matthew. The faith and hope of the kingdom is strengthened by the example of the king, which really has been, you know, an idea throughout all of this, but that's what I want to focus on here at the end. This last passage, verses 22 and 23, here in chapter 17. And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered, that is betrayed, into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved when they heard that. <clears throat> well, in this passage, we see that Jesus embraced every aspect of his death, even betrayal, even an act of treason by one of his closest followers. Jesus endured that. He embraced that. He deliberately went up against that as part of his death and also as part of his resurrection. Now, you might have missed it due to an issue in translation, but I did argue back when I taught on this that the word that we translate delivered, it refers to the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. Again, if you want to see my arguments for that, I can resummarize those. But just for now, just to state that I did argue that this is the betrayal of Jesus at the hands of Judas. And I focused on that reference because it was the new element in the passage. When Jesus gave his prior announcement, of his upcoming death and resurrection, he did not mention the betrayal, but here he mentions it. So it's the new thing he wants them to learn. So I decided to focus on that in my own message on this passage. Now to make the news even heavier for the disciples, I made the argument that Jesus announced this first at a church meeting. You see them gathering together. They've been separated for a while with this whole transfiguration thing. Jesus and three of them going up over here, the rest of them being over here, but now they're gathered back together, one big happy family all over again, and in this context, Jesus says, oh, by the way, I'm going to be betrayed. So very much a jarring first meeting after they come back together, and so you can understand why they were distressed or sorrowful to hear that news. Just as it says, they were deeply grieved. But amazingly, as grieved as the disciples are, Jesus himself is still going toward Jerusalem. They've made it as far as Galilee. You know, that's about a third of the way from where they were up in Caesarea Philippi. He is still very much heading toward all of this, completely unfazed in terms of his actual decision to undergo this plan and to go through this death and this resurrection. And that determination serves as a model for us because the righteous very often 
not only suffer at the hands of the wicked, but are even betrayed by the wicked. Jesus has already warned his disciples about betrayals from loved ones in Matthew chapter 10. It is very much a part of the Christian life to endure your family and your loved ones and people you trust turning their back on you or sneaking up behind your back and sticking a knife in it. That is something that is very much a part of God's kingdom. And Jesus makes that kind of betrayal even more certain by enduring it himself. If Judas betrayed Jesus, then no one's off limits when it comes to betrayal. Speaking of Judas, Judas himself was the one person no one expected. I mean, you saw there at the end, I read the account from the Last Supper, where everyone suspects their own self rather than Judas. No one's really thinking, oh, I'll bet it's Judas. No, it's just Judas was completely without any kind of suspicion. And yet he betrayed Jesus. And so really these kinds of things in our lives, they can come out of nowhere. They can come from the person you would least expect, someone that you trusted. And yet, in spite of all of that, as disciples, we can take courage from the example of Jesus because he's been through all of that. He's overcome all of that. He has shown himself and what he has in store for us to be greater than all of that, even betrayal. And in this way, the faith and hope of the disciples are very much strengthened by the example of our king, making the kingdom of God a way of life that can very much be lived because the king has already lived it out, even in things like being betrayed. <clears throat> and that is as far as we have gotten in Matthew's fifth section so far. And all of that to say this, I do think there is a common theme here in terms of what Jesus wants his disciples to learn first about his kingdom as he goes through this section and prepares them for his own death. The kingdom of God requires faith and hope in the face of suffering and death. I think every passage in some way contributes to that idea in this first portion of it. So this is what Jesus wants his disciples to learn. I will go through those things again just very briefly, just as a matter of final outlining. Uh, first passage, which is Jesus' first announcement, about his imminent suffering, death, and resurrection, that first passage functions as the first view of this common theme. It offers you a kind of quick summary of everything Jesus is about to show you over the next you know, uh, chapter, I guess, really. The next passage on self-denial and discipleship takes the main theme of this portion and amplifies it. It shows the suffering and death as being a bit grittier when endured as a matter of choice, as a matter of self-denial, but also shows how strong our faith and hope are and how lofty those are that we can look past a whole lifetime of difficulty and be motivated by something so far off when Christ returns. Thirdly, the passage on the transfiguration finally shows that the glory of our future will outweigh suffering and death. The vision the disciples had on the mountain is a great encouragement by showing us what our eternity will be like if indeed we endure these things that Jesus has lined up for his disciples. The transfiguration also gives Moses and Elijah as examples of victorious hardship. These are men of God who very much suffered in their own time and in their own ways, and yet there they are with Christ in glory. So it shall be with us if we follow in the same path. Then we go to Jesus' explanation about John the Baptist and how it takes us a bit more into the theme of suffering and death namely the inevitability of it. Here is a man who very much fills the shoes of the deathless prophet Elijah, and then he dies, making it all the more likely that there's going to be a lot of death to face in the kingdom of God. But that is something we can face just as he did. And then, of course, we have the exorcism, where Jesus teaches about the power of unbelief and the necessity of growing in faith and how prayer comes into all of that. And I said that it was very much an illustration and a teaching on what you need to live the life of a disciple. If you have all these mountains facing you and you need those mountains to move, you need faith. You need prayer. This is how it's done. This is the how-to of living this life in God's kingdom. And then finally, we saw that the faith and hope of the kingdom is very much strengthened by the example of the king who embraced all of this himself, including betrayal even at the worst of all of the interpersonal, the psychological, the relational aspects of being in the kingdom of heaven, being betrayed. I mean, that's the worst thing that can happen to you, between you and a friend, you and a loved one. 
Jesus endured that. He overcame that, showing that we can do the same. It very much strengthens our faith and our hope as we go through what the kingdom of God has in store for us. So, having gone through all of that, we are leaving this portion of Matthew's fifth section, moving on to what Jesus has to teach his disciples next in terms of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And I'm happy to move on. I very much am. Because, again, this has been a, this has been a heavy-handed section. I mean, every, every week as I sat down to write these messages, it's just like, ah, oh, death again, suffering again. Got to give out the bad news again. Just, I'm, I'm happy to leave behind a portion of Scripture that is that stark. I mean, I've, I've studied it. I have faithfully taught it. But it's time to move on to something else. I really am ready. But as we move on, we cannot forget this. This is Christianity 101. As the suffering king begins to explain his kingdom, where does he go first? You need a lot of faith and you need a lot of hope. Why? Because there's a lot of suffering and there's even going to be a lot of death. Christianity 101 is that. That's where he goes first. You have to keep these things in your own mind. We may be turning the page here in Matthew, but you got to keep these things in mind. you got to make them part of who you are as a Christian. Your idea of discipleship has to have this in it, and it's got to be a foundational layer. Self-denial. Back on that passage at the very beginning, I talked about adding self-denial to our list of things you have to do to be converted. We said repentance and faith, and then we added self-denial. Why? Because Jesus goes there first. Why does he go there first? Because this stuff is happening. This is what the kingdom of God is like. And you need a lot of faith and a lot of hope to get through all of that. But Jesus gives us reasons to have that faith. He gives us reasons to have that hope. And we can remember those things as well. We can take these lessons with us the rest of our lives. Even if we are going to a dark end, we can remember all of these things and take courage in the faith and the hope that Jesus Christ himself has fashioned for us and given to us in these ways. And that is what I think Matthew has been doing as he has constructed this portion of his book. And that is what I would have you remember before we move on to the rest of Matthew's fifth section. If there are questions, I can answer those. If there are comments, we can hear them. Um, is there anything to say at this point? before we uh, dismiss.